So good afternoon, Mark. Um, I listened to your talk this morning and I've got a few questions. Um, your talk was Creation in the Bible and Science. So Mark, you originally studied earth, earth sciences and mineral physics. What influenced you to explore theology later in your career? Sure, that's a great question and one that I would have to spend some time unpacking in a way because um, like many of the people who are speaking in this conference who have come from a scientific background, perhaps worked through theology, some, some of us are ordained in various denominations and, and religions as well. Um, I think my evolution as a Christian has been very complex. So as far as I can remember, as, long, as far back as I can remember, I've had a, a quite a sort of quite a religious sort of sensibility. I was quite a pious child in many ways, even though I wasn't brought up as a Christian at all. Um, I remember asking for a Bible for my 12th birthday. Mm. My parents were a bit surprised, but anyway, I, I, they bought me one. I read it cover to cover, didn't understand very much of it. But at the same time, I was, my interest in science was growing and growing. Eventually, I decided to go to university, um, studied earth sciences, got very, very interested in the, the physics side of things. And during this time, I was also you know, developing my life as a Christian, going to church quite, quite regularly and so on. But I think that my life in science, so, so I studied a PhD, went into a postdoc in research. My life in science, much as it was, it was occupying me intellectually, there was something not quite all there in the sense that you know, there's something missing. Almost the other people have talked about that scratch you can't quite, that itch you can't quite scratch. Um, I got married and my wife, who was a theologian, started thinking very seriously about ordination. And the kinds of questions she was asking about uh, herself, about a spiritual journey, um, what one does, the sort of wider purpose of one's life, um, started ringing bells with me too. And so mm -hmm. I, I met with various clergy in the diocese, this was in Oxford at the time, um, sort of thinking through questions of ordination, they were very, very keen actually that so people from sciences in particular should start thinking about, um, you know, a career in the church, ordination. So I, effectively what I found was that all of the doors I pushed on kept mm. opening. Okay. So before long I found myself reading a degree in theology whilst also trying to keep my science going at the same time, got ordained. I found that actually studying theology was every bit as fascinating as anything I'd done in science. I think coming to it as a scientist, I'd rather expected it to be a bit easy, and probably because I was a Christian, actually I'd already known much, you know, I understood much of it already. Actually, the complete reverse was true. I discovered, much to my delight, that it was rigorous and academically, you know, challenging and hard stuff, and to this day I've, I've kept with theology, trying to keep my science up at the same time, so I try to... Um, bridge the gap, if you like, by working in the science and theology field. But I suppose I'm more of a theologian than I am an active scientist these days. So that's a, a very, very uh, shaggy dog story about my spiritual journey, also including my scientific journey. Essentially, it's not a complicated story, but I think I've always had a sense of spiritual searching as well as my scientific identity. And your talk um, is about creation in the Bible, and you mention multiculturalism of the Bible. Can you explain what this is? Sure, this idea of multiculturalism, I latched onto that really because it's a very convenient term to talk about the, the great diversity of creation material there is in the Bible. In Christian circles in particular, we're used to largely focusing on Genesis 1, Genesis 2 to 3 as well, the story of Adam and Eve, and then really assuming that that's all that the Bible has to say about creation. It's all about in the beginning and then, well, the world gets on with its thing. But actually, once you start to look in more detail at the Bible, particularly later on, there are little mentions and references of, to creation material, including references back to Genesis 1 and, and the, the, the story in the Garden of Eden, in various places throughout the Bible. But, as, as well as those, there's also other material that you start to think about it theologically, it's clear that what's being discussed here is the way the world works, the way the world was set up by God, and the way the world relates to God. So biblical scholarship, as an academic discipline, has really expanded this idea of what exactly is creation in the Bible, and really become to realize, come to realize that it is, it is a lot more than just Genesis. Another feature of it is that it's very diverse. 
So as well as the Genesis stories, you get other very, very different kinds of material which speaks mythologically and in poetic terms about um, the relationship of God to creation. And this is why I use that word multiculturalism, really, to try to um, introduce the fact that uh, there is a huge amount of variety here. And partly that is probably because what we have in the Bible is a series of texts that came together over well over a thousand years. So you have a huge variety of reflections on the topic of creation. It's not all uniform. So dealing with that multiculturalism is one of the things I'm particularly interested in. What do you do with that, um, uh, that theme of creation if it is so diverse that you can't necessarily see one single theological truth in it? How do you then extract um, divine truth from something which is so, so diverse? And I suppose um, some people look at the dark matter and the Big Bang and things like that as, a, as creation. And you actually state in your talk, dark matter and energy is something that's an embarrassment to physics. What do you mean? Yes, a friend of mine who works on dark matter calls it the big embarrassment for physics. I, and not something I've seen in print, but he certainly says that. Uh, he's an atheist, but he certainly feels this is the big embarrassment where um, religious people could get onto physics and say, you know, What's this all about? Um, the simple idea behind dark matter and dark energy is that um, essentially the, this has come from uh, cosmology, astronomical studies of moons and galaxies, the expansion of the universe, the realisation that there is an awful lot more mass energy in the universe than we can observe directly. In fact, if you do, up, do the sums, you'll find that what we can observe directly is actually only about 5% the mass energy of the universe. That means there's another 95% dark matter and dark energy that we know almost nothing about. It's entirely mysterious. Now hopefully um, in years to come physics will solve the problems and work out what it is, but at the moment it means that all of science, this vast edifice of natural sciences, is built really on the 5%. So that's why it's an embarrassment really, because we actually understand so very little of the universe. And that's why it's so difficult to make claims about science being this um, very confident enterprise that has complete uh, control over the natural world, understanding of the natural world, because actually we only understand a really very small fraction of it. That's why I, I think we tend to refer, it, refer to it behind closed doors as an embarrassment for physics. And um, you talk about history being really important when we read the Bible. Why? That's right, yeah. So um, when I came to study theology, um, again, sort of from this very early interest as a 12-year-old in the, in the Bible as a source of truth and, you know, realising that this was very different from what science was telling us about the world. Um, when I studied theology, uh, I came to grips with academic study of the Bible. It was unlike anything I'd ever come across before. It was rigorous. It was very scholarly, it was very disciplined, and it involved um, learning completely new ways of studying and reading the text to, to what I had imagined. And in particular, um, modern biblical studies tends to emphasize what we call the historical critical method, which is the need to ground the texts in the historical circumstances and contexts in which they grew up, so that um, if we debate now what they mean, we can at least say something about what they meant way back then. And, and that, by and large, has been considered to be the important starting point. We need to get back to what, what did Jesus mean when he said this, or what did Paul think when he wrote that, um, as, as our starting point. From then, we can perhaps do the theology, but we need to get back to the historical um, starting point. Now, that has turned out to be an enormously difficult um, question what did the authors mean when they wrote this or, or wrote that? Um, and it has occupied biblical scholarship for, well, two to three hundred years now. And the thing I, the point I made in my talk, which particularly appeals to me, is the close parallels I've noticed with biblical study. And being a scientist, I'm an experimental scientist, I'm you know, trained in how to handle data and how to analyse it. And I find the techniques of biblical study are really very similar. Um, the Bible is almost like a, a collection of data that we apply models to. There's always a degree of provision, provisionality here. We might find new historical discoveries that are perpetually kind of changing the models and changing the way we look at this 
data. So I, I find the, the parallels between biblical study and science very appealing, which is one of the reasons I, I, I got into it in trying to understand how science and biblical studies can, can speak to each other. And you say the Bible sanctified and creaturely. Can you expand on this? Sure. That's quite a mysterious term which comes from um, a theologian in St Andrews called John Webster. And I find his work very appealing because in all of this, well, it's one thing to read the Bible as an historical document written by humans a long time ago, but many of us read it because we believe that there is something very, very significant contained in it for us today. It's not just like reading the text of the Magna Carta or something like that. There is something um, that, that, that is going to leap out of you at the page, we hope. There is, it's going to give us direction, give us meaning for life today, we hope. How do you do that if it's an ancient historical document? Well, we could read it as an, as, as an like the Magna, Magna Carta, but you, you know, you, we have to have to develop a method for or understand the techniques involved in perhaps reading it theologically. Now, there are various ways we can do this, um, and by and large, many of the debates in Christianity involve disagreements over how one should read the Bible. And there are two possible um, extremes that you could choose. For instance. One school of thought might say that the words of the Bible are the, you know, the, the, the absolutely accurate words of God that were beamed down to Moses and that Moses just wrote them straight down. Another school of thought might say that, well, what we have here is really just you know, the musings, the historical musings of, of people way back then on the idea of God. There's no kind of divine content to them. That would be the other end of the extreme. But what John Webster suggests is something not quite between, but using both of those. So the, Bible, the text of the Bible is sanctified in the sense that God works through it to, uh, to sanctify those who, who read it with, um, with faith, particularly through the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's also creaturely in the sense that it's a creature, it's a creation just like we are, with all the limitations that, 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 that comes with it. So it's, it's finite rather than infinite. It's um, grounded in history rather than eternal. It's a creation like us, but nevertheless, it can be a vehicle for the work of God. And I find that quite an appealing um, way of reading the Bible because it means that I can um, study it historically, but also get some kind of theological value out of that. And um, you've written a book, and your book follows on from William Brown with a move to the New Testament and Jesus, which you spoke about just earlier. You emphasise that this is really important as a starting point in understanding Christian framework in science. Sure, yeah. So when I was putting this book together, I hadn't read William Brown's book then. It's called Seven Pillars of Creation. Um, I discovered it when I was about, probably looking back on it, about two-thirds of the way through, and it totally changed the perspective I, I took on the book. His whole point is that um, the Old Testament con contains these seven pillars of creation, seven kinds of texts speaking of creation. Um, Genesis 1 is one of them, Genesis 2 to 3, the story of Adam and Eve, is another pillar. But um, he introduces this, this point about the multiculturalism of the Bible's creation material. Um, but what he also does with that is, in introducing the diversity of the creation material, he parallels it with various discoveries in the natural sciences. And it's sort of a very creative, kind of, you know, very, very positive book trying to make links between the text of the Bible and the various natural sciences. But what I felt that um, was really needed as the next step was to bring the New Testament in, as Bill Brown, as an Old Testament scholar, focuses on that. But um, me, as a New Testament specialist, really thought, felt that there was something missing here. So. I started extending his argument by bringing in um, some of the texts in the New Testament which speak about Christ um, and his work in creation. Of course, it sounds very paradoxical to speak about this man who lived 2,000 years ago, who died on the cross. How on earth could he possibly have been in the beginning at creation? But I, I explore why Christians came to think this idea and develop how this man could be seen as God. and therefore with a, a role in creation, and to look back at what Brown did with his seven pillars and to expand the picture like that. Thank you, Mark. So um, if people want to hear the full, full lecture, they can, and thank you for your time, and it was a pleasure to listen to you today. Thank, thank you. you.